Hi, this is Cyvergence with Anna London, and today we will be talking about the concern of jumping to conclusions. It is incredibly important in cybersecurity, both physical and logical, that we do not assume, right, make any assumptions on what is or isn't there, especially when we're analyzing logging analyses, you know, from our Splunk logs or our logarithm logs or our solar rhythm logs or our honeypot or honey net threat intelligence or our vulnerability analyses from the reports, right, of findings um, that we glean from tenable Nessus scans or what have you. I say this because A lot of um, people, especially in today's industry, our news, um, unfortunately, are jumping to conclusions and putting bad data out there, which is a huge concern and can incite, um, you know, a potential war, both physical or cyber war. Um, And I say this because we all need to be responsible in our messaging, right? So, you know, I always teach, you know, when we're briefing our cyber executives, for instance, or whatever level in the echelon that we're providing that briefing to of findings and risks and alternatives, right? Um, that we brief to fact, okay? We're matter of factly and we, and we speak to the good, the bad, the ugly, right? So that we can identify problems and of course work to enact, you know, change, you know, actually actual conduct a root cause analyses, you know, to identify the root of the problem, especially if it's systemic, right? And take action to change it, okay? Um, Right now, I'm going to say this because, you know, the majority of our Congress, right, and include our President of the United States, uh, with all due respect, do not have a background in cybersecurity, right? A lot of them are lawyers and come from a lot of other capacities, right? But they do not have a background in security. I think the only one that does, to my recollection, um, is Don Beyer, and he's the district representative for uh, Northern Virginia, in fact, he's in my district, to be quite honest with you. And he just attended a, you know, he went for AI training or what have you. So at least he's trying to obtain some type of knowledge, if you will. But learning buzzwords and what have you, right, is not enough. Um, it's incredibly important that everyone that are cyber um, SMEs, right, subject matter experts, engage, you know, our district men and women, our congressmen and women, right, to provide advisory services so that we can help them make more informed decisions, especially when it comes to our nation's uh, cybersecurity, right, and critical infrastructure protections, right? So they're writing the laws, right, especially when it comes to cyber and diplomacy and a variety of things. And a lot of them are doing so without, you know, the proper knowledge, right? What would happen the event of? And when you look at logs, because even logs can be spoofed, right? Right now, Russia and China, of course, are the, you know, our go-to, you know, easy to blame type of enemies. But right now, honestly, if I wanted to, you know, I could use proxies, right? Uh, Proxy firewalls and servers or what have you. And I could actually spoof my location and actually make it look like I'm coming from Russia or China or Iran or what have you to um, hack the Pentagon or what have you, right? So it's incredibly important that the news, um, first of all, the news doesn't need to know everything. We don't need to know everything because that is impacts our national security, right? I'm a military veteran and I do agree in transparency, absolutely. But there are certain things and messaging that are classified for a reason, right? News should not be broadcasting, of course, what our next battle steps are, right? What our plans are. I mean, how we are securing our data, what um, what physical and logical approaches that we're taking that we're sending our allies, for instance, in the Ukraine war. It's one thing to talk about the budget, but it's a whole other thing to talk about, you know, the tanks and uh, the missile defense and air defense and all these things that we're sending, right? And then talk about and even provide diagrams, right, of, of who's doing what and where, right? Um, there's so much what we call OSINT out there, the open source intelligence framework. And, uh, even, you know, plainfinder.net, for instance, is one, right? There's so much that we just give away like it's nothing. We take, we take for granted, right, the, of how uh, open we are with everything, right? Um, and it's very concerning. We need to kind of stop, kind of pull back a minute and not be so open with everything. Um, and then of course, when news gets a hold of something, right, and they take it forward, okay, and then gets briefed, just like the Chinese balloons, right? 
So whether or not they were actual weather balloons or they were actually used for uh, SIGINT, you know, signal intelligence or human intelligence or, you know, whatever they were trying to acquire, right? I mean, F-22s are just not scrambled up to knock down, you know, something that's benign, right? And if they were, then that makes us look, you know, all the way inept as a country, right? Um, when we're talking, even news folks, when we're talking and providing news and we're putting down our president and we're putting down all these things, right? Um, you know, look, you may or may not, not like who's sitting in the president's seat, but at least respect the office of the presidency, right? It's not just him making the decisions. A lot of people don't realize the power of the purse actually resides with Congress. So the president really can't do much, okay, without getting a budget uh, approved. He can't even go to war, right, uh, without actually getting a budget approved, okay? Otherwise, the president risks being impeached, right? So the president is a figurehead of the company. He's got a cabinet of generals and advisors or what have you to help him, you know, do the risk assessment, right, and um, help him to make more informed decisions based upon risks and next steps, okay? But as it relates to cybersecurity, it's very concerning because, you know, again, when um, something is spoken of, of, you know, the intelligence said, you know, that's, for instance, all of our vulnerabilities, right, within our critical infrastructure, our systems, right, our network and systems architecture is actually should be classified or highly sensitive, should not be open to the public domain. It's one thing to talk about a ransomware breach or what have you, but if you notice, right, the construct, the, the sensitive nature of what happened, you know, was rarely, um, you know, provided until after the fact, right? But, and as, as a community, as a cyber community, I love the fact that we are, um, open and engaging, and we do help each other, right? Um, you know, we do share threat intelligence or what have you, you know, need to know, et cetera, right, to help each other advance and secure our data, right, because that's our primary mission in life, okay? But I just wanted to put this out there that, you know, with news and everybody's just, it's all about the emotional element, right? It's okay, the sensationalism, you know, it's like, oh, you know, Russia hacked us or they hacked our voting systems. Well, what if it wasn't actually them? What if it was somebody sitting in the States or somewhere else actually that spoofed? Because you can spoof IP addresses. You can even spoof, spoof MAC addresses and you can spoof logs, right? So if we're not encrypting our data, right? If we're not anonymizing our data, both personally and of course professional data and sensitive data, right? We're doing ourselves a disservice, okay? So the news needs to do a better job of actually representing the fact, but also being very careful to understand that what they're putting out there puts uh, people at risk, right? People, processes and technology, right? Um, at risk, uh, whether it be corporate or government or even nonprofit, right? And then, of course, our allies, right? And not to, of course, announce, right? Um, you know, we should have the element of surprise, for instance. You don't announce what your battle plans are, <laughs> right, to your adversary, right? You don't do that. And so even Congress, and they have these briefings, and it just is um, it's shocking to me, you know, every time I hear, you know, some intense details and the news, of course, are demanding these details. They don't really have a right to that stuff. They have a right to transparency. Yes. But there are certain things. That's why we call it classified data. There's certain t data types that are intended for a certain need to know. OK, to make those decisions. OK. And that's why we're hiring these folks, right? We, we um, vote them in office, right? And we're supposed to entrust that they're going to do right by, of course, passing the budget, you know, using our tax dollars and not misappropriate funds, et cetera, right? But also then make informed decisions on behalf of the American public, right? In which there's certain things that we just should not, you know, just should not be made aware of. Now, if you want to be made aware of, then go get yourself a top secret clearance, go work for a specific agency, Right. But note that don't put that out in the news. Don't put that out in the public domain space. Right. Because you're honestly doing more harm than good. OK. So um, and again, for everyone that has an emotional tie or element to politics, I don't want to get into whether you're left or right leaning or mid leaning or what have you. Cybersecurity is not about that. 
cybersecurity uh, does not have, uh, is, is not racially biased. It's not gender biased. It's not anything, right? It's trying to, uh, there's corporate espionage trying to get, uh, you know, advances of intellectual property of, of corporations, right? So that's a concern. Uh, you know, our critical infrastructure, right? Data taking down systems, for instance, our hydroelectric power and what have you, right? Uh, power systems, power grids, you know, RF frequency, uh, jammers or what have you that could absolutely actually be employed through those types of balloons, you know. So there's a lot of opportunity in which, um, you know, we do need to be looking out for, okay, but uh, we just need to be very, very careful in the way that we are uh, messaging and, of course, what we're vocalizing on behalf of the United States, on behalf of our allies, even on behalf of our enemies, right? So, you know, know thine enemy, right? Sun Tzu, right? So uh, know the enemy better than you know yourself, right? <laughs> so um, those types of things. And that's also how we take with the attack methodology, which is actually military methodology, right, that we apply, you know, to our cyber systems or what have you. And as we're trying to train the workforce, right, to be better at, you know, these data protections at multiple layers, right? Our DMZs, you know, our routers, our firewalls, our KG encryptors, you know, our uh, desktops, our laptops, our phones, right? You know, everything in between, right? Our servers, right? Our firmware also, okay? So the other thing you have to contend with is there is foci, you know, foreign ownership, coercion, or influence. And that's not just with businesses as well, right? That get outside funding or what have you, right? Look, whoever your investor is, Right. Whoever your investor is, is going to have a stake and a say in how you conduct business and the decisions that you're making concerning that business, what you can and can't do or what have you, because they can actually pull out and not then, you know, decide not to fund. Right. Or pull out from that funding. So it's very scary. But there's also foci, foreign ownership, coercion and influence when it comes to the code. Right. All the way down to the firmware, the chips and, of course, the code, the underlying code. Right. Uh, that we're utilizing. OK. So who owns the code? Because there's a lot of, you know, who's writing the code. Right. Just like Zoom. You know, everybody uses Zoom. OK. Zoom has a front person, a front distribution company here in the United States that actually is publicly traded. But if you do the research on the foci, the foreign ownership, coercion and influence, it's actually that there's two other companies on the back end in China that are actually writing the code. So, you know, be very, very careful in, you know, again, looking at what you're using, like TikTok, for instance, everybody uses TikTok and they don't seem to care, right? But the FCC even put out a warning, right? And the government no longer uses it, right? So because TikTok, not only is it, does it exfiltrate um, text messages from your phone, it ex exfiltrates everything from your phone. Your pictures, every time you log into something, it's capturing your keystrokes, your passwords, right? Uh, pictures, you know, text messages to and from, right? Um, you know, everything, you know, everything you're pulling up. And a lot of people will check corporate emails or what have you on their phone. So just note that it's taking keystroke per keystroke, um, you know, off of what you are actually doing and of course even in our zoom right so in our zoom meetings or what have you so be very very careful on what you're explaining in these messaging for forums right make sure you're securing your homes also good cyber hygiene starts at home so even though you're given for instance you know whenever i support a government client you know or whatever whenever i was government i would be given a gfe a government furnished equipment right that would have a vpn it would be a standard imaged laptop that I would use to remote into and do my job as long as it wasn't classified, right? So unclassified I, stuff I could do from home, checking email, those types of things. But obviously classified stuff I'd have to do in the SCIF, you know, um, the facility in which classified information is supposed to be uh, managed and maintained, okay? So, you know, everything has to be tracked. Even when you print something off, everything has to be tracked. And then there's the e-records retention program that OMB put out as well. So everything from your uh, social media accounts, if you're using them for official use, right? So just like the president's account, technically speaking, Trump's account that he was using during his presidency, uh, because he uh, transitioned from using from personal to per professional use, right? Uh, in, a, in an official capacity, honestly, that handle no longer belongs to him, nor does the data. 
okay, and those um, instant messages and, the, and those tweets or what have you that he was using, right? So that goes the same for Biden. That goes the same for, um, you know, Kamala Harris and what have you. So any of the congressmen and women, right? If, if you're using social media in, a, in an official capacity, there's the e-records management, e-records retention, uh, you know, provision that OMB put out, the Office of Management and Budget. You can look it up. Um, the memorandums are out there. You can see it, okay, and the requirements therein, okay. So honestly, they're supposed to transition when they transition out of a of a position into a new one or no longer in that position. They're supposed to actually hand over whatever documents, whatever instant messages, whatever whatever they were using in an official capacity belongs to the government, right? And then of course NARA gets involved, etc. That's why you're hearing a lot about our national Ar- archives, right? Agency because. They also handle a lot of that stuff too, um, be able to archive that data and what have you. And then each agency has a requirement too for data retention of logs, of messages, right, and a variety of things. So there's a lot involved with this. And I think we've just been very um, lackadaisical, very complacent about our way, the way we're handling data, the way we're messaging, right, in the news and others. And news people, just because you get a hold of classified data doesn't mean you need to put it out there to, you know, to the public domain. Because honestly, that hurts more than helps. It really does. I mean, it really does. Um, so, you know, again, transparency, yes. But go through the proper forums and the proper chain of command in order to, you know, if you identify something, you know, don't go out there and share it with the news, right? Go out, go and work within your chain of command to enact change, Right. Um, that's what we're supposed to be doing, okay? Because uh, there is what we call the Espionage Act, okay? There is. It's law. Anything with an act on the back end of the title, right, is, of course, law, right? And so, of course, whether or not you, for instance, you like Edward Snowden or, you know, uh, whomever, right? Um, if you are taking, you know, we're entrusted when we get clearances, we're entrusted with the protection of that data, and so whether or not we like something we see or not, okay, we have a duty. We have a duty to uphold the protection of that data, right? And so what we do then is we should go within our chain of command, you right, to alert, right? There's all kinds of whistleblower, uh, all kinds of things and sp- proper channels within that need to know, right, um, to in- enact change, okay? Uh, if you take it to a news outlet, furthermore, if you take it, for instance, to Russia or even Great Britain, who is an ally, you've now broken the law because you've broken the Espionage Act, right? So whether, whether or not you are for Edward Snowden or not, you think it's a hero or a traitor. Uh, personally, I think he's a traitor, right? I do appreciate transparency and honesty with things, right? But at what cost, right? At what cost, right? It's rendered our countries and our allies very vulnerable, okay? There is what they call friendly espionage, right? If you can believe it, friendly espionage. And that's why China's right in a, in a sense that, you know, just China's, you know, got espionage. They've got foreign actors here, right? And they're embedded in every institution. But so does Russia. So does Iran. So does all that, right? Um, and, and of course, you know, we've got the same. So we're, we're doing a lot of, as well for human intelligence, signal intelligence, right? All, the, all these things that we're all collecting on each other. It doesn't make it right, okay? Um, and so then, therefore, the proper vetting, right? And going back, if you are going to do business, for instance, I have a business myself, so I have to be very careful on where I'm getting funding from, even if it's from an overseas investor, because I want to look at the ties. So do a background. Do your due care due diligence. Look at the back background. Right. With Ford, for instance, Ford and the ties to the company that's providing the EV, right, battery uh, component, right, in Michigan, right, I guess they're tied to the PPC, right, in China, right, but do the back end, do care due diligence, right? It's just like if I was to take and, you know, do business with, I don't know, some overseas element and they had ties to ISIS or something, right? You have to be very, very careful. Do do your background, background check and do your due care diligent, due diligence on who you're doing business with, right? Um, because, it's, again, it's the foreign ownership, coercion, and influence, right? Um, so I'm not saying don't do business overseas. Absolutely. That's what helps our global economy thrive, okay? But just remember to do your due care, due diligence, and to make sure you're not getting in bed with a criminal organization or one that could put our national security at risk or what have you, right? That's all I'm saying. So anyways, like I said, don't jump to conclusions, right? Just to summarize, don't jump to conclusions, 
don't put emotions in, leave the emotions at the door, okay? Especially when you're reporting for work in cyber, right? Or any job for that matter. And just look at the fact, right? Look at the fact. And don't look at things like memes either. Do some deep dive analyses of really what's going on, right? If you see logs coming in that look like IPs from China, China or Russia, okay, is it though really? Because again, remember I said you can spoof those IPs. You can even spoof MAC addresses, right? So make sure you're doing a deep dive analysis before you, uh, you know, say the say the sky is falling, right? Um, you know, make sure that is in fact, you know, who we're dealing with, right? Do that root cause analysis to deduce whether or not it is a foreign actor or, or somebody in their basement, for instance, in the United States or in one of our ally countries, you know, just trying to cause up problems, right? Uh, which happens too, trust me, right? So, you know, look in our own backyard as well, because there's a lot of people that want to incite violence and riots and um, problems or what have you and divisiveness and everything else, right? But that's what I like about cyber, because our community is not divisive at all. It's all about fact. It's fact driven. It either is or isn't. And we hire people based upon knowledge, skills and abilities, right? So that's what's cool. And we do share a lot to improve, you know, upon our ability to, you know, protect our data. But just be careful, though, with that regard. Does the person that you're sharing with, right, whether it be a colleague, right, somebody in another agency or somebody in the news or whatever, do they really have a need to know, right, really? (laughs) Because look at the potential damage, right, that could incur, you know, we could end up in World War III, honestly, very quick-like, especially with the, you know, everybody, it is a sensationalism around, you know, of course, those balloons and all these other things. You know, was it, was it not, right? But before you sit there and go on behalf of Congress, on behalf of the Pentagon, on behalf of the White House even, or even in news, and say, we're going to be in a war with China. Do you know how many times I've heard that in the news right now? We're going to be in war with China by, the, by 2025? Really? And you want to announce that, though? If, in fact, that was the case. <laughs> Do you really want to announce that, you know, to the world? Okay? So that's just getting, that's just letting our enemy then know if, in, if in fact, it is going to be China, right? That's just letting them know, okay, 2025, yep, we're going we're to do it in the middle of the, the next elections, right? And when everybody is distracted or what have you, great opportunity to, I mean, really, you're actually given their battle plans, their battle strategy, which is the dumbest thing possible, right? Read Art, The Art of War, Sun Tzu, for starters, right? Um, anybody in the military, of course, naturally has read it, right? A lot of us read it. Um, anybody in strategy also you know, reads that book as well. But read that book, okay? It's not very, very long at all. Um, it's got some amazing insights on battle strategy that also applies to cyber strategy. So anyways, with that said, this is Cyvergence with Anna London, closing out, at least for this episode. And I look forward to seeing you in the next.